This time, the aggressive spinning colors were almost familiar. Suddenly, a pulsating entity appeared in the patterns. It sounds weird to describe it as Tinkerbell-like. It was trying to coax me to go with it. At first I was reluctant because I didn't know about finding my way back. By the time I made up my mind that I did want to go with it, I could tell that the drug was starting to wear off and I wasn't high enough to follow it. I told it, I can't go with you now. See, they want me back. It didn't seem to be offended and, in fact, followed me back until I sensed it had reached its boundary. I felt like it was saying goodbye. Re-entry was slow, and I was reluctant to take off the eye shades. Everyone's eyes were so sparkling when I took off my eye shades. I knew Sarah was on the verge of some breakthrough, but that her strong reaction to the colorful hallucinations were somehow holding her back. Can you stop short of contact with the colors? You can't help seeing them, but can you stop yourself from responding to them? She asked, is it best to hope and intend for something, like to see that little pulsating shining creature again? The best is to have no intention. If you intend something and it doesn't happen, you'll bump against it. You'll react against it. Just feel your body lying in bed and try and empty your mind. She nodded, and we all paused to look out the window, remarking on the beauty of the Thunderheads building in the spring sky. Sarah looked exhausted. Dose number three. I realized what Rick said was true, that the most intense part of each trip was spent tangled up in these colors. This time I quickly blasted through to the other side. I was in a void of darkness. Suddenly beings appeared. They were cloaked like silhouettes. They were glad to see me. They indicated that they had had contact with me as an individual before. They seemed pleased that we had discovered this technology. I felt like a spiritual seeker who had gotten too far off course and, instead of encountering the spirit world, overshot my destination and ended up on another planet. They wanted to learn more about our physical bodies. They told me humans exist on many levels. I needed to reconnect with my body in time for the blood pressure check and blood sampling. It was as if they, rather than Laura, were collecting the information and they appreciated my doing it for them. Somehow we had something in common. They told me to embrace peace. I could feel myself begin to slip away from them as the drug wore off. As I started to come down, I saw these things from their world that I really can't describe. I thought of how the South Pacific natives could see only Captain Cook's small boats and not his big ships until they actually climbed on board and touched them. The re-entry was very difficult. I felt sort of lost, but I sensed a tractor beam of Kevin's love and followed it in. My notes state that Sarah got up to use the bathroom. Upon returning, she said, I'm tired, but I'm ready for the fourth dose. This is the last dose. You can really go for it. Kevin added, Make sure you return. At five minutes, her blood pressure and heart rate went up higher than they had all morning, even compared to her two-minute reading, when people's responses are usually greatest. She obviously was exerting herself, but at what? We would find out only later. At ten minutes, my records indicate that she murmured. We have things we can offer you too. Spirituality. Okay, hurry up. Right there. Right there. I did it for you. There. You can go out. Sarah's notes from dose number four. I went directly into deep space. They knew I was coming back and they were ready for me. They told me there were many things they could share with us when we learn how to make more extended contact. Again, they wanted something from me not just physical information. 
They were interested in emotions and feelings. I told them, we have something we can give you, spirituality. I guess what I really meant was love. I tried to figure out how to do this. I felt a tremendous energy, brilliant pink light with white edges, building on my left side. I knew it was spiritual energy and love. They were on my right, so I reached out my hand across the universe and prepared to be a bridge. I let this energy pass through me to them. I said something like, See, there, I did it for you. You have it. They were grateful. I was coming down off the DMT, losing altitude. I would have to go back. I was a little disappointed that experience was spent giving when what I wanted was spiritual enlightenment. Should I have asked for something to take back first? I guess I don't feel comfortable in my role as an earthly spiritual emissary, but I did my best. I always knew we weren't alone in the universe. I thought that the only way to encounter them is with bright lights and flying saucers in outer space. It never occurred to me to actually encounter them in our own inner space. I thought the only things we could encounter were things in our own personal sphere of archetypes and mythology. I expected spirit guides and angels, not alien life forms. My own notes add this little exchange toward the end of her session. I saw some equipment or something, sticks with teardrops coming out of them. It looked like machinery. It may have been machinery. Sarah's notes describe her state of mind after these sessions. It's difficult to sort through all this. Was it real? It certainly seemed real, but so do dreams when they are happening. But there was something about this that was different from a dream. Even the lucid dreams I sometimes have. Were there really other life forms out there? Did I really send them the power of love and spirituality? Even more disturbing, did they somehow mark me? Are they watching me somehow? It makes me feel a little crazy and very confused. Even worse, I feel very isolated in my experience. How can anyone except someone who has been there understand? Maybe this stuff did make me go nuts. I know it sure changed my life. Now, what am I going to do with it? How do I keep something this big inside? I was not at all familiar with the alien abduction literature before beginning the DMT study. Neither were many of our volunteers. I knew almost nothing about it and had little desire to learn more. It seemed much more fringe than even the study of psychedelic drugs. However, once we began hearing so many tales of entity encounters, I knew I could no longer plead ignorance of the larger phenomenon. Despite my better judgment, I now feel compelled to weigh in with my opinion regarding the experience of contact with alien life forms. Let's review the popularly reported alien abduction experience. We will see the striking resemblance between these naturally occurring contacts and those reported in our DMT study. This remarkable overlap may ease our acceptance of my proposition that the alien abduction experience is made possible by excessive brain levels of DMT. This may occur spontaneously through any of the previously described conditions that activate pineal DMT formation. It also might take place when DMT levels rise from taking in the drug from the outside, as in our studies. Our current culture is fascinated with the alien abduction experience. Psychiatrist John Mack has published many reports from abductees, people whom he now calls experiencers in his books, Abduction and Passport to the Cosmos. As the event begins, Mack says, consciousness is disturbed by a bright light, humming sounds, strange bodily vibrations or paralysis or the appearance of one or more humanoid or even human appearing strange beings in their environment. Mac emphasizes the sense of high frequency vibrations many abductees report, which may cause them to feel as if they are coming apart at the molecular level. Some find themselves in familiar environments like 
a park with swings and figures emerge out of the background. Abductees also often find themselves on some type of examining or treatment table. Experiencers are absolutely under the alien's control. Despite the obviously unexpected and bizarre nature of what they are undergoing, there is no doubt in their minds that it really is happening. Thus, they describe their experiences as more real than real. Varying degrees of anxiety occur in this preliminary stage, especially if it feels as if one's consciousness is separating from the body. For many, the experience of fear is by itself somehow transformative. Letting go into the terror seems to change the nature of the experience from negative to positive. The individual may float or otherwise make their way into a curved enclosure that appears to contain computer-like and other technical equipment. Once the person arrives, strange beings are seen busily moving around doing tasks the experiencers do not really understand. Abductees commonly report seeing energy-filled tunnels and cylinders of light in these environments. The typical alien looks like the ones portrayed commonly in the media. Large head, skinny body, big eyes, small or no mouth, gray skin. However, Mac also reports frequent descriptions of reptiles, mantises, and spiders. Some abductees feel there is some kind of neuropsychological reprogramming or an enormously rapid transfer of information between the beings and the experiencer. Aliens may communicate using a language of universal visual symbols rather than sounds or words. Many abductees report a complicated scenario revolving around the aliens using their reproductive machinery to breed human-alien hybrids. However, Mac reports that the hybrid project is by no means all that happens. They may be gazed at closely and otherwise examined, probed, and monitored. Sometimes the experiencers feel that their health is being followed, especially through anorectal and colonic examinations, and they even report healings. On other occasions, the experiencers report probes being inserted into their brains through the nose, ears, and eyes, and they may feel that their psyche has been transformed. Implants are inserted under their skin, and they may feel certain that these represent some sort of tracking or monitoring devices. Abductees report that the beings appear to be greatly interested in our physicality and emotionality, seeming as is said of angels, to envy our embodiment. They need something that only human love can provide. This may even take the form of alien-human sexual encounters. These experiences can range from cold and bodiless to ecstatic beyond what is known to them in earthly love. As Mac describes, the experience of connection between one or more of the alien beings and the abductees with whom they relate is a powerful and consistent aspect of the experience. Commonly, the initial memories are of cold, indifferent contacts in which the aliens, especially the gray, reptilian, or praying mantis-like beings, render the person altogether helpless. It is common for abductees to feel as if there is one alien in particular with whom they have a special relationship. It's as if this alien is in charge. The relationship may later evolve into a greater sense of familiarity, meaningful connection, and even love between the abductee and the alien. Several of Mac's subjects report that they are greeted by aliens when they emerge into their reality. The aliens say telepathically, Welcome back. Some report a lifelong series of encounters beginning in childhood. Experiencers often report that the aliens are urgently notifying them that Earth is in danger. Their abduction relates to this in as much as they either provide reproductive material for the hybrid project or decide to spread the message of environmental degradation to a wider audience. As Mac's work with his subjects has progressed, he notes another common, perhaps even basic, element of the abduction experience. 
This is the transformational and spiritual nature of the encounter. The collapse of space-time perception, a sense of entering other dimensions of reality or universes, a feeling of connection with all of creation, Abductee's sense of belonging in that realm may be so acute as to create a yearning for it, a desire not to come back. Many abductees no longer feared death, knowing that their consciousness would survive the body's death. One even considered the idea of killing himself so that he could return to the blissful state he encountered during his abductions. The resemblance of Mac's account of the alien abductions of experiencers to the contacts described by our own volunteers is undeniable. How can anyone doubt after reading our accounts in these last two chapters that DMT elicits typical alien encounters? If presented with a record of several of our research subjects accounts, with all references to DMT removed, could anyone distinguish our reports from those of a group of abductees? Shocking and unsettling as they were, contact with life forms from another dimension was never on the list of volunteers' reasons for participating in our research. Neither was it something I expected with any frequency. Rather, it was the transpersonal, mystical, and spiritual states to which they aspired. It is to these that we now shift our attention.